To celebrate publishing over 100 episodes of the Fishing the DMV podcast and surpassing 2,000 subscribers on YouTube, I am giving away a free guided fishing trip with Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Services. The giveaway will run through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th, and I'm going to give you three unique opportunities to win the fishing trip. Number one, the number one way that you can enter the competition is by leaving a review of the show at Apple Podcasts. After the review at the very bottom, comment hashtag fishing the DMV and you're automatically entered in the sweepstakes. Number two, commenting on every video that I drop from Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. And then at the end of your comment, leave hashtag fishing the DMV. And then you're again entered to win the competition. Number three, the final way that you can enter a chance to win is by ordering online from Jake's Bait and Tackle. Every online order through them automatically enters you with a chance to win as long as you leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. The contest again runs through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Well, and it's so expensive. And and let's get, hold on, let's go. And three, two, one, and we are now recording. And it got a little too crazy and left in 79, moved to Hagerstown, raised two boys there. They live in North Carolina now divorced and then uh about 11 years ago and i moved to frederick 11 years ago uh after the divorce and you know just kept doing what i'm doing been primarily an auto technician and occasionally an auto salesman uh different times for the last 50 years so that's what i do and uh, i retired but a guy made me a great offer up in hagerstown to work for him and i can have off all the tournament time i need Ooh, that's awesome so that's clutch <laughs> kind of like having a sponsor because I he takes it easy on me because I'm an older guy, but uh, you know, I don't work that hard, but I make enough money to where I can go fish whatever I want to fish. So I don't have aspirations anymore to, to fish the elite series or the you know the BPT tours or, or the invitationals, but opens or Toyota series mixed in with the, the BFLs is what I do. Um, no, it's just, it's so expensive. I mean, it is insanely expensive. And everyone I've talked to, it's like, if you have a wife, if you want to have kids and a mortgage, how in the hell are you going to then go chase nine plus derbies all over God's earth? Like it's, it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. And what happens is a lot, the, the old school way of doing it, the crazy way is guys obtain several credit cards and they just finance uh, which is horrible through credit cards and they, they burn themselves out in a couple of years and some guys make it and the bulk of them do not. Let's take, for example, the new format, the EQ with the Bassmaster opens where you have to fish all nine to qualify for the elites. You have to be in the top nine. So they have 171 guys making that commitment, uh, 30 to 35,000 at least. And uh, only nine of them are going to make it. There'll be, you know, 160, whatever, some guys that uh, mm-hmm. will not make it. You have to either do the Elite Series or the uh, Opens again, or they'll have to do something else. So, and I tell you what, I fished the uh, Toyotas last year in 2022. And with the gas prices being up and the entry fees, the rent the house and all that stuff, I was spending $4,000 per tournament and uh, did not cash a check. In that series, I fished the Central with a bunch of friends of mine, which helped a little bit with the house rental. We split a house. But $4, yeah, $4,000. And that's not a week off work, which is, a, you know, another 1000 and, plus. And the Central's so, correct. So not like the Northerns where it's a little bit closer to Frederick, Maryland in our area. Like that's that's a drive. Yeah, it was, it was still. I actually did years ago, about 16 years ago, I did pretty good on Guntersville fishing the open. So it had that. Dale Hollow, which I was interested in fishing, and plus all my friends were fishing that, so it made housing a lot more affordable. With five of us renting the house, it was it, about fifty bucks mm-hmm. a night, so you know, that made it help there. But it was still with the entry fee almost you know seventeen hundred, and the gas was outrageous. I had eight the gas bills for eight hundred dollars for the week, <sighs> counting towing the boat down, towing the boat back, and it was like crazy. So it. Was, really high at that point. And, um, 
you know, and then you have a state fishing license. You fish Dale Hollow. You had to have a Kentucky license and a Tennessee license. I didn't know that. Really? So, yeah. Yeah. Well, only if you went up into Sulphur Creek, and that was one of the best creeks. So, and that was in, uh, that was the one in Kentucky. So you needed a Tennessee license too. So, it, was, it could be expensive. You know, it's very expensive. And I'm not complaining. I, I like to fish it. I fish for fun. You know, I don't, uh, have aspirations of making my living fishing. I just like at this point in my career, I like to travel with friends, have a good time. And, you know, lately I've been doing okay, cashing a check here and there and, you know, doing good. But, and you bring up something interesting though, like with with gas and travel, how much of it is being in the Northeast ish kind of in the Maryland DMV area where you have to commute more to get to all the tournaments? Because guess what? Spoilers. If you're in Alabama, you don't have to travel very far for 90% of the events. Correct. If you're in Frederick, Maryland, you're in Frederick, Maryland. I'm in Hagerstown, Maryland. Okay. Smith, that's going to be a lot more in gas. You know, the Potomac is the only thing, but hell you have to go through Baltimore DC to get there. Well, you know, fishing the Potomac from where I'm at, it takes me an hour, a solid hour to get to Reagan Preach. national airport, the gravel <laughs> point ramp. And if, if I go to where the tournaments are at, an hour and a half to get to Lisa which uh, BFLs to go to the uh, small woods. So that's an hour and 45 minutes. And, uh, you know, that's quite a ways. Away. You know, that's not that far. It's, you know, it's less than two hours, but you're there. So you got two, tw- if you fish the Shenandoah division, you got two Potomacs, you got a James river. That's three hours. And then you got curve four, <clears throat> four and a half and Smith mountain Lake about four. So it's, it's a lot of travel nice. and that's what I can. I, I know so <laughs> it's back. When I was fishing all the opens when I had sponsor, I was traveling. I fished Lake Amistad. Gosh. Oh, that was uh, three, uh, 2000 miles. It took me 31 hours to get one way oh to get there. Uh, you know, and then of course, Florida. And it just, it's, it's not a, it's not what you call money maker. There's a handful of guys that make money and then the rest of the guys go home without Lee. How did you get into this? Like, how did it all start? Okay. Being the, the way it all started was being a technician, auto mechanic, however you want to phrase it, and being a fisherman. My grandfather, who was the father figure in my family, uh, and I have three sisters and a brother, but uh, my grandfather and my uncles were all mechanics and they were all fishermen. So it's, I guess I didn't have, you know, I didn't have to look that far. That's, but, you know, that's what everybody did. I just rolled with it. And I loved going out on the bay fishing back in my young days in the sixties and seventies for stripers and, you know, and fishing for bass locally too. And, uh, my mom actually took me and my sisters and brother to a local pond in Randallstown area, a place called man's pond. And they had a little fishing rodeo, no money involved, just prizes for the biggest bluegill, the biggest bass, biggest catfish. And we used to go back there, you know, once or twice a year and fish these derbies. And that kind of got me going with that. And, uh, and what really got me into tournaments, believe it or not, I had subscription to Bassmaster magazine and there was a picture of Rick Clun in a skeeter fishing it, pouring down raining. And you know, say a picture says a thousand words. I just looked at it and stared at it. And for whatever ridiculous reason, I thought, yeah, that's something I'd want to do the rest of my life. I thought that was really cool. It was like an outdoorsy looking, he's in a little cove flipping something with his, uh, with all the rain pounding down on him. And, uh, I, th- I thought that looked good, you know, for some reason. So, yeah, I, I, he got me started in the, like, serious tournament fishing. I fished a few clubs and stuff. but And then, um, you know, at that point, I started uh, fishing clubs and red mans pretty religiously. And then uh, when they were coming to Bugs Island, all my friends that were serious were going to fish it. Ed Lofgren, who's a, is an old friend of mine, and uh, Frank Ippoletti and, and quite a few other guys, they were all fishing this tournament. So I jumped in and of course I finished not at the bottom, but you know, way back, way out of the, the check range. So I knew I needed to, you know, I needed to work more at it. So I kept fishing clubs and uh, red mans and then eventually they were called BFLs fishing them. And uh, then jumped in and out of the opens over the years. And uh, it, you know, I just didn't have working as a mechanic or an auto technician and raising kids. You just don't have time to spend you know, constantly fishing. I was pretty much fishing as hard as much as I could, but working a full-time job, it's 
you know, it's not easy. What what local clubs it, did you fish? Like the the smaller smaller level things, like Hagerstown Bassmasters or it, something like that. There was three clubs I fished in. I'm trying to think of it. Uh, the first one was from Kentucky Mountain. I'm trying to think what it was called. I can't even remember. It was a Kentucky Mountain club. They were in uh, Thermo. Oh, wow. Uh, Bob Gray was the president, I think. I, I don't remember much about it. And then I got with Bush Ward and I became friends. And uh, uh, I joined his club, which was, gosh, I don't even remember the name of that club. It was uh, whatever it was. That was a club and also based out of Hagerstown. And that was uh, Butch Ward and a bunch of other guys. And I fished that for a while. And then there, then there was some other club in Maryland where it was before the split happened. Um, it was a club where you didn't belong to a club, no meetings. You just joined it. And it was, I forget the name of that. I there, there was a split? Yeah, because they, half the guys went to uh, the FLW trail. Oh. Uh, the, it was called the Bass Federation, the T, uh, TB. F, yeah and then there was the bass it was this, so the club split and so and i and i joined the uh dc federation for a while because all my friends were in it so i joined that a couple of years and then i just like the bfls it's a well-run mm-hmm. format and for 200 bucks you can win 5500 if you win and uh you know i've won you know 11 1200 a couple of times here recently um uh, the smith mountain lake third place and then i had a cur- just a couple weeks ago, fourth place at Kerr in a very top tournament. And I'm um, hoping to do well at the Smith Mountain coming up here this Saturday. So, I, I, yeah, it's something you can do for, for, okay, here's the thing. For 200 bucks a tournament, it's actually 220 now. They raised a couple of hours. So you got five tournaments. You fish that. You make the top 45. You fish a regional. And then that pays, I think, somewhere at forty to 50000 for that. And then if you finish in the top six, you go to the All American for a hundred thousand dollars. So if you beat everybody from your region in that All American, you go to the uh, Toyota Series Championship for a shot at two hundred thousand. And if for some ungodly lucky reason you win the All American, besides that hundred thousand, you also qualify to fish the uh, Red Crest for three hundred thousand. Uh, you know to win. But so the BFLs offers you an opportunity to fish your region, regional championship, all American championship, the Toyota series. If you, you know, finish well enough and the uh, Red Crest, if you happen to win the all American. So I mean, there's a lot of opportunity. BFLs give you so many opportunities, but I, I always like to say like the BFLs and the coast is it's the difference between the national league and baseball and the American league where you have the DH where, a multi-day event is just a different type of cat when it comes to game planning strategy and getting a vibe for that thing. And, oh, absolutely. And one thing I've I've been trying to ask some of my some of you guys, you you local sticks, is how did you make the jump and how does like a kid out of college make the jump to saying, like, okay, hey, I'm great in a one day derby. I want to try to do the coastas or the opens or something like that. Like how, how do you gear yourself up to understanding the difference in the game? Because it, it's almost like a different game. Well, you have to put the practice in. You have to uh, manage your fish. So in the tournament, these BFLs, I can just go into an area and just hammer them just nonstop, just keep catching, catching, and just keep wearing them out and calling through smaller fish. Whereas if you have a multi-day tournament, first off, you need more spots. In practice, the biggest thing you got to do is not be sticking a lot of fish. So many guys, even seasoned guys, I see catching fish with hooks. Really, You don't want one here, one there, just checking. <clears throat> if you're on a school, you want to check, you know, the size maybe or something like that. But but so many guys that have to work full-time jobs, they get out and they get so enamored with catching fish, they forget that, hey, you need to save some of those fish. You know, you want to have multiple in your practice. You want to locate multiple uh, spots. Not only that, you need to check your weather. What's it doing? Is it warming up and all of a sudden the fish are catching at secondary points and all are now going to be in shallow coves, you know, looking for beds and stuff like that. So you got to figure out where these fish are going to be in a couple of days. Are you catching them in the sunlight and, you know, it's real sunny, but then the tournament days are going to be rainy or overcast. You got to factor that stuff in. And, um, uh, you know, if you're catching them, say cranking and chatter baits, 
you know, on the bank and stuff. And then all of a sudden the sun comes out that during the tournament days on the two or three days or four days, uh, you know, then maybe you got to look on the docks and stuff. So, you know, but you don't want to be hooking too many fish and you want to have multiple spots and be aware of your upcoming weather, do, do, where the fish are going to. Do you see that a lot? As to do you see that a lot with guys that they have success at the club or BFL level, but they have a problem making that jump to the multi-day events. Yeah. Well, first off you have uh, guys that are better, better quality fishermen that are fishing some of them multi-day events and you don't, and you have guys from elite and, you know, higher levels, the touring pros that just happen to be in their neighborhood and they're not fishing a big tournament. They say, Hey, I got a chance to go in here and win this tournament on my home water or, or a body of water that I fish a lot. So you're competing against a handful of those kind of guys that are really good, you know, seasoned pros, touring pros. And then you got guys jackpotting tournaments that are, that live there, but are not touring pros, but they just fish that body of water like all the time. And, uh, you, you know, you have to factor that in. You just have to, uh, the biggest thing, just like I said, you have to, you have to factor where the fish are go go at now and where they're going to be during the tournament days and factor in the weather and stuff like that. And also another thing you gotta watch out for is catching. The biggest thing I think is catching too many fish. And when you're in a one day tournament, you just keep slamming them all day. You know, worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's your trip home. So you have to manage your fish, you know, look at what it takes to win. You know, if, if 14 pounds a day is going to put you in the top five with a chance to win, you know, you're getting close to that 14 pounds, then you want to save them fish, you know, for tomorrow. That was the best advice my mentor gave me. It's it's when we started to fish college national championships that were multi-days. And he said, you're not trying to win it day one. Don't go out there day one saying you're going to win it because you got two more days. It's about it's about Correct. setting a pace. And I think that is such interesting advice when it comes to you when you're practicing. Yeah, you're not out there trying to find them today. It, especially spring we had Kerr and then you're going to Smith this week the, everything's just changing every day oh yeah well this I've already reviewed what, what's going on it's crazy warm weather it's been cool but now the nights are going to be in the 50s at, at Moneta where a house I'm staying at a friend of mine lives down there and uh it's going to be in the 50s and then 70s and 80s through the tournament wow. days was calling for a Friday and Saturday rain but now it's just calling for partly for Saturday, partly cloudy, partly sunny, and sunny the rest of the days. So they're definitely going to be up shallow. I mean, there is no if, ends, or buts about it. There could be some deep, but most of them are going to be shallow looking to spawn. It's going to be a slugfest. How hard is it when you have so many years on Smith Mountain Lake to approach it with an open mind when you always come the same couple of months because let's say uh and we'll talk about it eventually is, is your lake oneida win on the bass opens let's say it's the first time you've gone there it's really easy to fish right. with a clean slate but when it's like it's april at smith right. this is what i've done the last couple of years it's tough well let me tell you I, other than being a boat captain for a junior sqt several years ago where my guy i got it into a win awesome i was him and I, I was letting him do the catching but I was right there over his shoulder giving him direction the whole time we've won. I have yet to win on the Potomac and I've guided on there for years. I know I've been fishing Potomac since 79 and uh, just haven't been able to wrangle up a win. I've, you know, done well over the years, but that's a, you know, it is tough when you, when you know so many areas, you don't think with an open mind. Uh, when I try to fish with a clear mind, these last couple of years, I've been doing that. Just try not to, think about anything, take no extra advice, just go out there and fish what you know. Look at the water, look at your gauges, look at the temperature, the wind, the color of the water, all that stuff, and just try to fish free. And it's, it's not it's not easy, but if you can learn how to fish free, that's really, really important. And you just don't have any preconceived notions, just look at it and say, uh, like at Kerr, I was fishing, I went there, I was totally free. I, fished up river up some creeks i know grassy but then i went back in this cove two foot of water and it was really tough and the water wasn't that warm it was almost 60 degrees a week before that tournament and it dropped all the way down to uh 50 it was right at 50 so i went into off almost muddy water two foot deep 
and a cold front. You know, the water had really dropped and was just dragging a shaky head and caught all them fish. Why? And, what in your gut told you that when, when you're in well, the heat of battle? It, here's what it was. It was approaching 60 degrees. I didn't get down there while I was at 60. It was already starting to drop a little bit when I got down there Wednesday. I typically practice Wednesday through Friday, three days of practice. So I knew back there, they sp I knew they spawned back there, this area I was at, but I knew they weren't up on the bank on beds. They would drop back into that three, three and a half foot in the bank. It's like two foot and it drops almost into zero. It's real shallow and then it drops off in a little drop to about three, three and a half foot. So I was working that shaky head, cast it out into the shallower and just work it to that drop and let it drop down in there. And they weren't even, I could not even feel the bite. It was just, they mouthed it. Hmm. It reminds me of when I was guiding on the Susquehanna was for small mouse when I had a jet boat and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I would, you could drag your tube or your jig or whatever you was throwing hair jig and you just pull it along. And it felt like you got a rag or something or a wad of leaves and you're lifting your rod and you just feel the yes. weight with you. What they're doing, they mouth that bait and you're literally pulling them along. As soon as you feel that weight coming up, you instantly got to set the hook. Otherwise, they'll open their mouth and let it go. I've had clients tell me that all the time. I think I got some leaves. I said, no, set the hook. Leave me. And, uh, you know, it's hard to get them to, to do that because there's no tap or no little tug or nothing like that. So anyway, I figured that I didn't know for sure because I obviously can't see them in my live scoop. Wasn't really picking them up that well in that, you know, off-color water and shallow water. So, but I knew they were there somewhere. And uh, I just pulled. I knew they wouldn't be biting very good. They weren't chasing all the guys throwing chase baits earlier in the week they were biting spinner baits crank baits so i i got that little shaky head a small worm and just pulled it along and you could feel them and then i you know set the hook on them and that was it but what made so, you decide on a shaky head for kerr well it's a secret little bait that i've been working with it's a little worm on a shaky head hook and uh everywhere i go i've been killing really i I don't know if you know who Michael Duarte is. Mm -mm. Young guy. He's an awesome fisherman. He actually, we were in a regional together and we were back in the Matter Woman <clears throat> a couple years back in a regional and he had to set up and uh, really catching them like crazy. And I was throwing a jig and some other stuff and wasn't getting nearly the bites he was getting with that thing. So I eyeballed what he had, got my, got the stuff I needed and started throwing it and, uh, Everywhere I go, they're, they're biting it. And I love that you have a smallmouth background too, because this is something that I stay up late at night work, stressing about is what is the, what the hell is the difference between a shaky head and a Ned rig? Why? Like, it seems like it's the same damn thing. Well, it pretty much is a shaky head. Typically you'll have a, a your hook will be bit embedded into the bait. And typically it's a, you know, four five, six inch worm on a shaky head. It typically everybody's got their own little spin on it but a ned rig would be typically the uh mushroom head with an exposed hook uh in a shorter bait like could be two inches or two to three inch range where a shaky head typically is a four to six inch four to four to even to seven inch and uh, i've shortened that down mine's kind of a hybrid between a, a normal shaky head and a ned rig mm. and you're and power fishing this thing more so correct kind of dragging it that that particular tournament i was literally wasn't even shaking it like i would normally get shaky head i was wow. just gently dragging it it was almost like a dying shad that was just pulling through the silt oh. or, the blood or whatever there dude that is painfully slow <laughs> oh, it, I, hate that. I like power fishing but i mean believe me, i'm a crankbait guy at heart and uh crankbait and jigs and stuff but uh <clears throat> that's what's so shocking is the guy that won that tournament said I, I had i had bryson on the show and he talked about throwing a crankbait and it's like oh wow you're a crankbait guy but you even said in that tournament like okay i love the crankbait but no it's the shaky head that's what's going to make it work yeah i don't know the guy who won it but i did read some of his articles and comments and he's the one that said because he was there fishing earlier in the week saying it was almost at, at right at 60 and it dropped all the way down by the end of the week at saturday to 50. So that tells me they're not, that probably pulled them off the beds or got them away from the beds. And, uh, but they're going to be in areas near the beds. When it got up to 60, I feel like that should have pushed them in towards the bed, the that bedding areas, you know, the coves, the back ends of creeks, any place that had like suitable spawning habitat. And then with that 
cold weather keep pulling off, I feel like they pulled away from that a little bit, you know, and, um, and that was just a gamble on it. The last day of practice is where I found them. I went in there and caught a few quality fish and I said, okay, I'm done. I know what to do. Cause I was up the river. I was catching them, you know, 10 fish a day, but, uh, all in that little shaky head deal. I was catching them early in the week on crankbaits and spinnerbaits the first day on Wednesday. And so Thursday I was doing a mix of shaky head and power fishing and, uh, and the shaky head was prevailing as the better bait. So then I wasn't even going to go out on Friday, but I said, you know, I'm just going to check this air one spot out. And I went in there. Sure enough, I caught a three and a half and a couple that was in the two plus pound range as better. And I was catching up the river. So I said, okay, I'll just go with this. And, um, uh, I was lucky to get a 411 bite uh, in there, so that really helped. So you never even touched a crankbait on game day? No, nothing. Wow. I just had one, one rod on my deck, and that was it. That is <laughs> guts. I don't yeah. know if I could do that. So uh, no angler to go ahead and put on, you know, kind of fishing I was doing. Uh, we're going to do some finesse fishing. I told him what, basically what I was throwing, so he tied something on. He caught the first fish. He ended up catching three. He had five bites, but two jumped off on him, and uh, he cashed a check. I forget what place he finished, but he got a check, and uh, and then I, I had uh, when I weighed in, I was in second, but then I dropped down to fourth after that. So that's it, I mean that was still a fantastic finish that you had, and that tournament was tough. I mean you were one pound yeah. out from from second place basically. I mean guys, just yeah. I, I have the weights up here. It's fourteen oh nine for second place, fourteen oh five for third, and then you had thirteen eleven. So that's pretty solid yeah and you know what the the other year when i fished uh smith mountain lake i finished third i had 18 one but a lot of my friends i roomed with they didn't even have a fish one fish or two fish and the, the whole field would really did bad i mean it was a tough tough tournament so i'm starting to think like that might be my forte just going and doing start concentrating on finesse fishing and uh, start winning a few of these things I, I really wonder if if finesse is going to play more and more as as it goes on and we have more and more pressure on our waters. You look at what these West Coast anglers and these Japanese anglers have been doing for so long at the big tour level. And I feel like that's starting to trickle down now where you have a Kerr or a Smith that has four or five tournaments on it. Look at the Potomac. How many tournaments have been won with a drop shot or a shaky head, for God's sakes? They like, fish around on there. But, but there yeah. are some that's done well on uh, frogs, you know, if the grass mm -hmm. is there. You can catch them on power fishing. Well, just take Lake Norman where they just had the red crest. I mean, uh, uh, Edwin Evers was throwing a big glide bait up alongside yeah. the docks and catching them. And uh, right now, the swim baits and glide baits are really catching big fish. So I just now spent a thousand dollars on glide baits and swim baits to upgrade my box. So I hope I can catch something on them and I don't just sit there and click dust. What, what do you think about the whole glide bait, swim bait thing? What, what's your thoughts on it? Well, but I know, you know, having caught fish with giant fish already in their gullet, you know, tails hanging out of their mouth, I've seen it. They, they'll eat big fish. I mean, but the size fish that eats that kind of bait, you know, there's not tons of them out there. There's more, you know, pound and a half, two and a half pounds, stuff like that. But when they get their mouth big enough, they'll, they want a big meal. You know, you can, but. You have to be committed, just like the A-Rig. You know, you just mm -hmm. have to be the right time, the right place, and you got to be committed to throwing it a lot. You, you, know? you, so, you mentioned Jenny, Jenny Brower beforehand, and, and the swim bait craze really reminds me of him and the old jig bite. When I did high school fishing, we talked about, like, the old guy that would always lock a jig in his hand. If he got five bites, he pretty much won the tournament. And I feel like that's what the swim bait is now, where you see guys, if they get five bites with a big swim bait or a glide bait, like, they're the right ones. Yeah, but it, it doesn't always work either. Look at uh, mm -hmm. Chris Saldane. I mean, he is the glide bait king, you know, supposedly on the Elite Series, but he doesn't always win. And he, he does, sometimes he doesn't do good at all, but uh, he is committed to it. But he can catch them. They'll, they will bite. But uh, you have, well, I feel in most of the guys that are, if you look carefully at what they're doing at the top, because I watch, I listen to almost every podcast. That I got like 15 of them on my Apple CarPlay truck uh, thing. And when I travel back and forth from Frederick to Hagerstown, I'm constantly listening to all from, you know, from, from Pangrak to all the other guys. And uh, plus I watch carefully on the, you know, all the TV shows and all the, read all the articles. 
And a lot of the guys are mixing it up, just like Edward Neighbors I mentioned. He'll throw a glide bait, but then he'll throw a jig, then a chatter bait. Then I think you got to be versatile. You got to be good with all that stuff. You got to know when to throw a Ned rig, know when to throw an A rig, know when to throw an eight inch glide bait, you know. And it's, it just comes from intuition and from uh, experience yes. stuff. But it's an open mind for me. I feel in my heart that the biggest thing that's helped me here recently doing a little better is by keeping a clean, open mind when I go. And I've been fishing long enough, I've been fishing my whole life, you know, for God's sakes. So I should know, I'm like hitting myself in the head, like, what am I doing? I need to, this is ridiculous. I should be kicking butt out there. So I just started relaxing, going out and looking at the water. I don't care what anybody says or what the reports say. I look at the weather, I go out and look at the water and the conditions and just let my instincts take over, you know, like what I should be doing instead of worrying about, you know, I got to do this or do that. So, and also, and I love how you talk about practice and what is the purpose of practice. And and I'm trying to get better with not trying to win practice and just find an area that has them and then try right. to fig and try to figure it out or more fine tune it during the tournament. Because I do feel like, especially when I was younger in high school and stuff, I would just be wailing on them in practice and try to get it so fine tuned. But right. I really didn't feel like I, I had an understanding of the area I was actually fishing, if well, that makes sense. Fun. I had a long conversation with Gary Klein. Uh, it's about 2015 when they were at the upper bay. He didn't make the final day and uh, or didn't make the cut for the third day. So I was there. and I bent his ear for a while, and he was a very nice guy. And we talked for a long time. He said, the biggest thing <clears throat> is guys sticking fish. You're wasting your fish in practice. He said, don't win practice. He said – most all the elite guys, they'll, they'll have the screw lock things and put a worm, a swim bait, put a Kai Tech on there or whatever bait you're throwing and throw it in. And, you know, don't stick, don't drive that hook in that fish's mouth. He said, then you'll get an idea of, of where they're, you know, what they're doing and what they're eating. You know, you're throwing a swim bait, you don't get no bite. You know, you, maybe they're down below. Are they looking up? Are they up in the water column? Are they down on the bottom? Of course, live scope now is all the rage. It has mm. been a couple of years now. And, you know, you can look and see them, you know, you just got to figure out, you know, what they're reacting to. You know, throw your jerk bait, you have to, no hooks on them. And uh, you don't want to, basically he said, you don't want to stick all your fish in practice. You don't want to win practice. Look for fish, uh, figure out ways you can catch them without sticking them. Or not catch them, but, you know, get them to bite. Maybe pull them up and get them to break the surface and spit your lure out. And then you got, you know, you got a, an eyeball of what you're looking at. You can tell a lot of times when they grab it and hold on to it, you know, I'll throw a wacky worm up there with maybe a hook, but it's bent over. Or I'll cut the tip off the hook and uh, they'll, they'll hold on to it, you know, and uh, you can feel the weight. You can judge a little bit until they let go of the, the bait of what you have. But the key is find as many areas as you can move a lot. Don't sit there and hammer your fish. Charlie Hartley, I talked to him and he said openly on, on the mic various interviews that he just loves catching fish and uh he'll just keep catching 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 you burn your fish out you can't do that but here's another thing you're working i work full time you know and get off for all the tournaments i want but most guys have to work for a living so you want to catch fish fishing's fun you know fishing is a fun thing so you're out there practicing for a tournament and you're just catching fish and you get caught up in the moment and you want to keep you know, it's fun to catch. I love catching them too. So it's hard not to bring them into the boat. You know, you just want to feel the bite, you know, catch one here, one there. If I go in that cove, I caught a couple of fish and I got out of there and the temptation was great for me to stay there and just slay them fish. But then I think, well, why would I do that? I won't have nothing for the tournament. You know? and, and I think that's easier with vertical techniques, like a jig, Ned rig, shaky head, wacky worm. I have got to get better with how you can implement crankbaits and jerkbaits in practice by bending the hooks and still feeling the bite. Because, you know, with jerkbaits, as you said, like sometimes they're going to hit it on a slack line. And it's just getting better intuition with that to know my bites, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it just takes the practice. It depends on what you want. I mean, I'll throw a crankbait with live hooks sometimes and just you can do that and catch one. But then don't keep throwing. You know, you got this point you throw out make a cast the second cast you get a three pounder at that point look at your if you don't have live scope gently 
coast up there with your down skin and look and see if you, you know, if you're seeing quite a few fish, it doesn't make any sense to keep throwing your crankbait and catching fish after fish because, you know, you're going to burn them fish, you know, let them fish. You catch a one, two or three pounder, let it rest, go to another point, try to find another location. Don't, don't <clears> that <throat> try never to catch one more than one fish off an area. And, mm. you know, waypoint that point. You got this point. It's good. You've seen fish on it. Or even if you didn't see on your electronics and you just caught an, a decent fish, waypoint that that spot and move on to your next spot and then your next spot and your next spot. I've been guilty of that, too. You get on a good spot and you just feel like you want to wear them out. But, man, that just doesn't do you any good unless you're just there to have fun. You know, if you so, want to do well in a tournament, you have to you have to keep going move spot to spot to spot to spot and find as many good places as you can because you might get a, a high number you might get 120 boat number and you go out there and then like the first four spots you got or got boats on them mm -hmm. so you got to have a lot of spots you know? well so with smith um and i'm talking strategy it's probably there's going to be a couple on beds in, in general in your history is, is bed fishing something you try to work into your game plan ever, or do you stay away from that and just focus on pre-spawners and post-spawners if possible? I I don't have no problem with catching them off beds. I just don't particularly like it. I just, mm -hmm. not my thing. Sit there and just, I've caught them off beds, but it's just, and Smith Mountain Lake's a good place to do it. The water's color's right, and they typically spawn reasonably shallow where you can see them. And this tournament's going to be a, a, definitely a spawn tournament in my mind i don't see any other way around it but um i i'd rather free spawn is my thing free spawn or post spawn you know once they get done spawn they move out jerk baits and crank baits top water depending on the water temperature and this tournament also could be won by throwing top water I mean, you could throw, oh yeah you could throw a frog right up on top so most likely i'm not going to be pulling down and then wacky worm in a or finesse jig to a bed i might do a couple like that but most likely i'm going to be covering a lot of water throwing a frog and looking for blow-ups you know looking for fish swirling on it and stuff like that and waypointing them spots and then coming back and, and see if you can get them to bite or drop a worm or a jig in you know in that area that bed it's hard because um, I had I had um, Tyler on who who lives on Lake Anna and we talked about this from a strategy standpoint that in multi day tournaments usually the spawn unless you're in like Florida that will hold you can have you can get a cox or someone that can actually do it but in a one day event if they're on the beds I almost feel like it personally is like well shit I gotta like look into that because how are you gonna beat a one day event if it's a full bed tournament and then there's so the strategy of like okay well then do I go do I look for my bed fish first or do I wait? And then do I, do I try to fill out a limit and then go head hunting? Well, the thing I, I was know. doing is you put your trolling motor and not well, maybe on high, but on a higher setting and cruise them banks, look at the obvious spawning areas and little pockets and coves and just get right up there shallow enough to where you can see a couple feet off the bank and you can look down in there with good polarized like depending on the sun, you know, either yellow or bronze or brown lenses and just go down there looking for them and marking them, marking, marking, marking. Uh, you can also just be visually looking at them or like I say, you can take a frog with the hooks bent in and just get them to come up and like swirl at it or something like that. And you know something's there. You can waypoint that or you can mark on a map or whatever, however you like to do it. And, uh, you know, some people put, stakes down in the ground you know the ground which is yeah but you know but uh you, you know waypoint your fish or try to make a reference somehow on your waypoint you can you know buy them two rocks or whatever you can like type it in uh but you want to cover as much water as you can you by visually looking if the water's a little bit off you can what i'll do is i'll just take a frog or some kind of top water looking for a swirl or something like that and just keep moving, 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 making marks, making waypoints. And then during the tournament, come back and then throw a, you know, wacky worm or a finesse jig or something, you know, creature bait into the, uh, into the bed, you know, that's, that's the best way to do that. Just, just mainly covering water, getting lots of spots because I fished Smith Mountain Lakes a bunch before 
And uh, I seen a bunch of beds and there's people already there. You can see them. They're already pulled down and they're, you know, catching them. And you just keep moving on to your next one, your next one, your next one. You you can't rely on just a handful of spots. You got to have as many as you can get. And, and that's actually a really good, so let's say if it is on Friday that they're, they're really locked onto beds, would you then be looking for more beds or be like, Hey, listen, they're on beds. I'm going to have a backup plan, a pre-spawn plan, get a limit. And then I'll just go head hunting and just start looking to see what fish are on beds the day of that haven't been picked off yet. Right. Or, uh, well, I mean, I feel like both work. Yeah. I would have, you know, I'd obviously have going on the tournament. I have bits and bed fishing rods laid out and okay. search rods, shallow crankbait. You know, I'd have, mm. have a shallow crank and a chatterbait um, and a frog. If the water's t- is right. If in practice I had some blow ups on a frog or something like that, so I, I would uh definitely have you know baits to catch them. My, my, for me, I would have like a frog or a Rico on its for top water and then a chatterbait and a crankbait, and that would probably be it. And uh, I might even have a swim bait laying there ready, you know, to, to throw so. That's what I would do and just keep going down the bank in between because there's going to be cruisers. I've seen them many times mm-hmm. at Smith Mountain where there are some on the bed and there's fish just cruising along. And then you got to lead them out, you know, like throw a, a, a Cinco or Wacky Worm ahead of them quite a few feet, you know, and then uh, hopefully you can intercept them, you know, like that. Because you can see them pretty good. I'm, I'm To this tournament, with the weather the way it's going, they they will be on the bank. There's no doubt about it. I mean, so with that said, what do you think the weights are going to be? What do you think tournament weights are going to be? Oh, I think they'll be mid to upper 20s to win. Probably 24 to 27 to be a winner. Easily 24. Like, unless there's something crazy that happens. It, it's. I think it's going to be easily 24. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, man, you're going to probably have to have probably 17 and a half to 18 to get a check, I would think. I am shocked that you have Smith Mountain Lake that is this little hidden gym in Virginia that puts out all this weight. And then the Bassmaster Opens are going to occur, which everyone I've talked to says, if it's 15 pounds a day, that'd be amazing. Where I feel like Smith would definitely produce way better than that for the Bass Opens if they went there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember years ago, it was oh, somewhere 07, 08, or 09, Skeet Reese uh, killed. Yep. He was throwing a swim bait, just working a swim bait right through the banks. Just I, I can't even remember what time of the year it was, but I remember he did slay him down there pretty good. Rojas was throwing a frog too, I think, and he finished high. Yeah. Yeah, so swim baits and frogs, I got a bunch. I mean, that's that's the hot rage right now is the uh, the swim baits, the uh, mag draft, mega bass mag draft. You got the six inch and the eight inch. And... Uh, you know, it, it, you don't get a ton of bites on them, but you know, you get you typically get some big ones. Yeah, you, you'll get some big ones, or or you'll break it off on a musky like I did up on the uh, up Potomac. So I learned a lesson there. Yeah, yeah, I've lost a lot of good baits to everything from pickerel to big stripers, to all kinds of stuff over the years. But that's why, uh, you know, you just got to decide what you want. I tell you something else that plays down there. I don't think. I'm trying to think what if it's post spawn. I went to a marina, throw a big jumbo spoon, flutter spoon. Really? Room. Just pitch it in there and let it flutter down. I caught quite a few, no giants, but a lot of good quality tournament fish. That's another technique. And this is something I've brought up too is I feel like a lot of people fish too many tournaments instead of going out and learning a new technique. And I think it's one thing if you're a pro angler, but if you're a weekend warrior, like I know so many guys interviewed, like, well, every weekend I'm going to fish tournaments. Like, well, then when are you going to learn a new technique? And a lot of them get stuck on that. And I don't know. I just feel like, like you said, the flutter spoon, never done it. I probably wouldn't yeet it in a tournament the first time, but that's something I feel like, oh, I should go out and play around with. Yeah. You should learn uh, all the techniques, I think. Now, don't get me wrong. If you got like that, my little shaky worm. I mean, I'll go ride that horse to it drops dead because that <laughs> fish. But I go out and practice, and I'll throw an eight inch flutter spoon. I'll throw a ten inch glide bait, and you know, a, a a rig with different kind of you know baits on it, and uh, whatever you know, just do the whole gamut. 
just to, so you learn more. So you, you know, you, cause sometimes they don't always want the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can always catch them finessing because the Japanese anglers in the West coast, they get hammered so much. So, you know, you gotta be able to do a uh, drop shot and all like that. I'll tell you something else I've been doing too, is that the moping. I don't know if I'm moping the way Gussie's doing it, but I got the, uh, the very hard to get, uh, smeltinator jig hooks with the, uh, the you know, with the smelt, uh, uh, Z man. Little Who did you kill to get that? Wow. <laughs> well, they're, they're talking about, listen, I'm coming back. I went to the classic. So I was at the classic and, uh, seeing the whole thing I do every year and I'm driving back on Monday and, uh, you know, I'm think they're talking about listening to all these podcasts going on. And they're saying, oh, yeah, the Gus Brian Gustafson is no relation to Je uh, Jeff, but he way up in northern Canada, they make them there in small quantities. Uh, as soon as I got home, I got on uh, Omnia. I, no, I got on their website. That's what it was. So I went right to that place. I wrote it down and uh, they, they were out of a lot of sizes, but I got some of the three eighths and quarter in these smeltinators. And they're, they're pretty cool little jig. And uh you know, so I've been doing that. And also what Christy won last year with that little FF sonar minnow. I got them hooks and, you know, just they were very lifelike. When you got really clear water and you want to drop down, you'd be surprised. You can get quite a few bites on them. It, what's also interesting to me is like, and, and guys, for all my high schoolers that listen that, um, that are part of the uh, Jake's Bait and High, uh, Jake's Bait and Tackles High School Fishing Club. This is important advice. Listen to this: you do not have to spend two hundred dollars in petrol and drive around the whole lake. Watch a lot of these Japanese and West Coast anglers that can just milk an area and have so much success, and they have a power with finesse and being able to figure out an area through multiple days. So do not think when you go to the James River or you're going to Stonewall Jackson that you have to figure out the whole lake. You just gotta pick a small area and figure it out and you can still have success. Now I don't recall the guy's name, but that Japanese angler, you mentioned the James, this was yep. a year or two ago. He didn't even go that far. He went up that one Creek, not sure which Creek he was in, but he did very short distance Went in there finesse fish and caught and won the tournament. You know, it was, it was like near, near the way in too. It wasn't far at all. Yeah. 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 There's fish around there, but I mean that, that one horseshoe, when you go down, where the uh, where the barges used to be on the right, you go to the left, and there's a big wide horseshoe, and uh, you got that bridge, that one bridge right there, that little walk over that's dilapidated mm. bridge. I always catch fish on there, but uh, he was all back through there, and uh, you know he won that open doing that. It was pretty pretty impressive. It's impressive, and what I find it so fascinating is the way I had it explained to me. Their mindset is they have like two lakes in their country, and that's it. And so their belief is there's fish everywhere. You just need to figure them out. So don't drive. Right. In America, we think like, okay, well, I have all of Kentucky Lake and I got a 250. So let me burn this thing and find right. active fish. And it's such a completely different mindset. And I remember um, it was, I think it was the Lake Seminole or whatever. You know, he was pointing to people. It's like, hey, is this off limits? Can I fish right here? And he didn't even put, he didn't even like turn his big motor on. He just threw the trolling motor out there and just started going around. And he, and he finished in like, I think the top 10. But right. it's just that mindset that they're, they don't care about the idea of it's a retread. If there's fish here, I will figure well, them out. Well, that's the point I was making the Japanese angler whose name I can't remember. He didn't have to run all the way down to the chick, you know, all the way back in the chick and, and fish that. So he did that. And my la actually, my last two recent top fives, I, I didn't go far at all. And uh, I went. Uh, Say this name. Ken, Kenta Kimuri? Yeah. 65 pounds. Yeah. Well, now, was that an elite or was that the open? That was the open. Open, yeah. April 14th and 16th, James River, 2022. Yeah. Yeah, he did well, and it didn't. You know, he didn't like you said. He didn't have to waste that gas and go all the way down to the, to the uh, chick. Chick. Now, the when I fished the uh, the cur, I could have uh, easily idled right to where I fished. It was that close to the uh, wow. up there, nut bush, and then also when a couple of years ago, when I had the third place on the uh, Smith Mountain Lake, I was boat sixteen. So as soon as I got out of the new wake, I spun around and fished this. Uh, this little bluff wall there, it wasn't high. It was just a concrete slab. 
And uh, I caught a three and a half pounder there on my very first cast. And there was still like most of the field hadn't even left the, you know, launched off yet. That's so, awesome. <laughs> and then I didn't get far at all. I just went around up in the craddock and just and caught a couple limits. And then went up the river and caught uh, a couple other fish, my bigger fish. So do, do we overcomplicate it? Because it is like example, classic Potomac. Everyone's like, I want to run to the beach, which I'm not saying doesn't have fish. But I've also cashed a lot of checks just staying around Matta Woman or Lisavania. Like you, you oh, don't yeah. have to necessarily drive all over God's earth to like There's have a, a good tournament. I mean, it's one off that they're all the rock jetties at Lisavania. And uh there's tons of fish. It depends on where they put the new wake at. That I mean the off limits at. But if you know, you can go back there in the back behind the uh the the docks and there's some areas back there you can fish. You can go to the, the islands and uh, you know, you can go back all you can go all the way back in Matta Woman, you know, if you want, past the that beach and beyond, and there's some fish back here in that straight away, you know, it's where it dies out. But I mean there's fish all over the Potomac. You just gotta know where to go. I mean, you gotta do your homework and figure out where they're where they're mm -hmm. hanging out. So Potomac can be tricky though, man. I mean that you got the tide, you got the moon phases, you got depends, you know, the wind, the water, all kinds of crazy stuff. So plus well, I, I, I have I always did well, but it's yeah. hard because that's like my home water and I just it's weird. It's just too much history on the place. It it makes it really I don't know how guides fish tournaments and guide and keep an open mind. I do not know how they do that. You can I think that's what killed me because I uh I got my captain's license in nineteen ninety nine and I was oh, guiding gosh. for Bill Kramer up I guided for myself at first, then I teamed up with Bill. And I was guiding on the Susquehanna. Hmm. And uh, Ralph Capasso had left and moved to North Carolina. And I had a, a, a bought a Ranger in the meantime. So I started guiding on the, the tidal Potomac uh, and with Bill. And I was doing, you know, like crazy. But, yeah, it does mess your mind up. The reason is you're always looking for easy fish. Because here's the problem. I take the clients out, nice people. We have a good time. But they can't cast accurately. If you're 30 feet from a piling, they can't hit the piling dead on. They're like a foot off to the left, a foot off to the right, or a foot short. And, you know, you don't want to make them feel bad. You say, you know, there's no fish there, so I pick up a rod and I pitch it right where it needs to be and then catch a fish. So, but, but if you keep doing that, you just make your clients feel bad. So you have to find the grant. You're always praying that there's going to be a good grass year, you know. There's a lot of grass, then you can just lob a bait out there, a top water bait or a worm or whatever. And, you know, they'll catch some fish. So that's, that's easy fish and that's not tournament fish. You know, you, the mm. tournament fish, you got to find them some out of the way, you know, obscure places that, that the fish are at. And it does mess you up a little bit on the Potomac. That's why I said I've never really won a, a big tournament on the Potomac. Done okay, done decent, but not a win. But when I go out, you know, when I went to um, Kissimmee back in 07, I fished Kissimmee at a Bass Open as a boater and went down there and caught a nine pounder on my second day. I caught limit the first day, caught a nine pounder and some other fish and was up in 12th place out of like 240 guys and 30 some of them were elite guys. So I was in good position. And then the cold front came in and that killed me. I only had, could weigh in one fish the third day. I made the third day cut, which, you know, it is what it is. I just wasn't familiar with Florida cold fronts they, that were that severe. You know, it shut them down. And Florida fish, cold front, they don't like that at all. But I did no. catch a nine pounder. It got me an extra thousand bucks, you know, and I finished 27th in the tournament. So that was a good start, you know. And I did well in some of the other lakes that I'd never been to Santee Cooper. Uh, I think I just finished out of the top 50 there and I had 35th, I think on the red river in Louisiana, which I'd never been to, you know, on any of them lakes. So what is your most memorable place that you've been? Oh God. Well, obviously when I won as a co-angler up on Oneida Lake, that was, that was awesome. We have to talk about that. <laughs> but um, When I went to Florida, and I was just feeling strong. I just secured a sponsorship with Matt Pano, who owns Optimum Baits out of Temecula, California. And then he hooked me up because he went to college in Japan for five years, speaks fluent Japanese. 
His dad, Tony Pano, started Optimum Bates, and they had a network of stores everywhere. So he could speak fluent Japanese. He would go to these Japanese fishing places and lure manufacturers and convince them to, they wanted to come to America, but they couldn't speak English. So he was their liaison through his father's store, or his store. And uh, so he would get all these baits and the money, get paid for taking the baits and distribute them through his network. So he made a lot of money like that. So he hooked me up with, uh, he was taking care of me. He wrapped my boat. Had my, Well, he didn't wrap it, but we went to a place in Tennessee and I had boat wrapped. Uh, I had sponsorship with uh, IMA Lure Company and Depths and also Optimum Baits. Uh, Keith Bryant sponsored me with Pal Rods and, uh, and Rick Pierce had me sponsored with Bass Cat Boats. Now, I didn't get a free boat. I got like a half price boat. Back in then, bass boats were running about sixty grand, and I got one for like thirty. You know, so it's pretty good. Deal. Yeah, it's a much better deal than paying full price. It's so better than a hundred thousand dollars right now. So I'm like, I'm like on top of the world. You know, I went, I didn't get a lot of money from these guys at all, but it was still decent. You know, it was a decent sponsorship with the different companies. I was on top of my game. You know, and I went to Florida, went down there, was catching tons of fish every day. And I was in like 50th place the first day, caught that nine pounder and a four and a half pounder and some other fish. So I was in 12th place the second day. So I was really, you know, it was a great tournament. I felt good. And um, another tournament that comes to mind is I fished uh, the same year. I fished uh, the lake next to Gunnersville. Now I can't even think of it. Um, whatever it was. What was that lake called? It'll come to me. But it's the lake that dumps out from the Gunnersville dumps into uh, mm-hmm. has the uh, has the Decatur Flats in it. I'm trying to think what is the name of that lake. I don't know why I can't think of it. But anyway, so my buddy Frank Capaletti's leading the tournament. We're both fishing it, and I caught good fish every day, but didn't make the third day cut on this bass open. Wilson Lake? No, it's the other side. Yeah, that Wilson's above Gunnersville, and this is below. Um, oh, it'll it'll pop in my head in just a second. So, yeah, he we he he had a boat that didn't have the right amount of insurance on it. So he ended up taking borrowing my boat. I was getting ready to leave to go home, but he borrowed my boat. He ended up winning in it. So that was uh, it was pretty awesome. It's like fifty seven thousand dollars. That's awesome. Yeah. So we went out partying that night. And he he bought everybody a steak dinner and we drank too much and they had a good time though. But uh, yeah, I would say that that. The, the the win at Oneida and the one at um, uh, Florida at Kissimmee was was awesome. And, and we got to talk about Ornata. Like, what was that like? Okay. What happened? So I'm going through. You know, this is pre-divorce. I'm not. You know, wasn't that great? But so I did. I sold my boat. Went through a divorce. Had to go through all that stuff. And I I sold my boat. And I didn't have a boat. I was going to order another boat another basket boat. So meantime, my buddy Frank talked me into going as a co-angler. I said, man, I don't want to do that. I know what that's going to mean. You know, it's terrible. So it's not terrible, but I just like to control the situation. So I go into Potomac and it was not good. You know, I knew where to go because I was guiding on there. So anyway, that tournament came and went, went to Lake Erie and got paired up with a guy that was, had no clue what he was doing. We caught no fish. And then the second day, I got paired up with Ed Riley, who at the time was president of the Maryland Bass Federation. And uh, we went out, and I ended up catching two five-pound smallmouth and three other nice smallmouth and had a big bag. I think it was like 20 pounds or better. And But because I didn't do nothing the first day, I didn't make the third day cut. Mm. So I, was, I, was, I said, okay, whatever. So three weeks later, we're at Oneida Lake. And uh, I was feeling really good for some reason. So I get paired up with uh, Steve Daniels out of Florida. He's been a veteran, been around forever. And I'm telling you, the, we went out there with spinner baits, went down halfway down to Nada Lake on the right hand side. There's a little creek that goes into a residential area. We were just out from that in this little cut. We were just right next to a grass edge, and they were smallmouth were stacked in there. So Steve tells me I was catching 75 fish a day, and I'm thinking like, man, he. He must have burnt these fish up. So there's probably nothing there. So, you know, I went in with an open mind. We started throwing spinnerbaits, and like right away, we was catching three pounder after three pounder 
I mean, all wow. day long. It was insane. We were just laughing all day. We probably, between the two of us, I know we caught over a hundred fish. It was easy. Oh my God. Hard. He was, uh, he was in the top five, I think after day one, my buddy Frank was actually leading after the first day. So then I was leading up by far on the co-angler side. I had 16 something pounds. And, uh, the second day we, uh, let's see what I'm trying to think here. What happened? This, yeah, the second day, the third day got canceled. The second day I got paired up with a guy. I can't remember his name, but we went all the way down to the far end of the lake where the, the, the Erie canal or whatever they called it was. It was at the bottom where the stone wall was at. And we yeah, were yeah, yeah. tubes in there. We catching like one after another, after another pound and a half, pound and three quarters. He caught a two pounder and that was about it. So we ran up the lake. We started catching a few more halfway back to the launch ramp. We caught, uh, I caught some better fish. I had 12 and a half pounds the second day. So I'm still in the lead. Well, I didn't know that though, because I was rooming with Frank. I was traveling with him because I was a non-boater. So he weighed his fish and I was a little bit later. So he was waiting on me. So I wanted to wait and get to see where I was at in the standings and I, you know, I had to leave with him because we had to get back to the hotel. So we get up the next morning, we're getting our tackle together. And some guy comes rolling through the parking lot in a pickup truck saying the tournament's been canceled. 35 mile an hour winds. The Coast Guard said, it's a no go. Don't do it. So Bass agreed to that and they decided not to. The guy said, yeah, be at the uh, ceremony at nine o'clock. They're going to give out the awards. So I'm thinking like, am I still in the lead or not? Because I had 16 something and then I had 12 something. I'm like, like, man, I was really getting anxiety. You know, I'm like running around from boat to boat. These guys prepping their boats. Anybody got a report from yesterday, you know, the day before. And I finally got to this guy. I had one. I looked and I was still at the top. So I'm like, right on. Yeah, that was great. So I won that. That was dude. Cool. And uh, yeah, so that was awesome. You know, we went out. And uh, so let's see. That was in, when was that? That was 2003. Yeah. So. You know, we went out that morning. Of course, normally we go out to dinner that night. Whoever our deal was, the guys I travel with, whoever has the highest money finish buys dinner for everybody. I like but that. Because it was morning, I ended up buying breakfast. That was a, <laughs> that was a cheap get away for me. <laughs> and uh, Frank said, "Yeah," it said uh, this guy just won the tournament. She said, "Well, this other guy over here said he won the tournament." So it was uh, Art Ferguson had won the boater side. So he was also in there having breakfast the same day, you know, the same time. So we all chatted for a couple of minutes and it was all good. The way back home, I was riding back and I was getting my phone call after phone call after phone call from friends and, you know, people that know me. That's congratulations and stuff like that. That was pretty cool. I liked that. Especially on a place like those northern fisheries, especially back then, were just insane with what they could turn out. I mean, even if you lose the tournament, you're catching a hundred fish. It's, it's all yeah. smiles. I honestly don't know how many we caught, but it was like almost every cast we were catching and they were all just size. They were two and three quarter to three and a quarter, all, all right around three pounds. Every one of them. That's insane. And he said, that's where him and his wife were staying at a house near that cove. And uh, he said they were just killing them. They were just stacked in there. Like you wouldn't believe. And uh, there's a couple other top 10 finishers were fishing right near us. There was a whole bunch of fishing right in that area. It was October of 2003. Wow. That, that was a good thing. And uh, wow. So, you know, we were pretty happy. Yeah. Well, well, you, know, wins, well, you never know when you're going to get a next win or if you're ever going to get another win. But right now it feels pretty good, you know, getting some top fives. I'm going to keep this top five thing going as much long as I can. No, and, and and Lee, thank you so much. I mean, I don't, I don't want to keep you keep you all night and do our, our one of our big three hour spiels because I know you got you got a lot to do to prep, and hopefully the next time you're on is after you win win uh, this weekend on Smith. Yeah, I'm hoping to win. I want that so bad. I don't care about the money. I just want to win one. It's been it's been a while. And actually, I need to win a big. You know, I've had some club tournament wins, but to win a BFL or a Redman or Open or a Toyota Series out of the front of the boat is is my goal. I want to make that happen I, I, the last thing honestly i, I just want to kind of like leave with was you know you being a dmv guy like do you fish anything like i don't know, like little seneca or uh, four locks or anything like that to kind of keep yeah, your skills yeah. up yeah well, the whole time i lived in hagerstown when i moved up here in, up in hagerstown in 1979 i started fishing the uh 
slack water and four locks and uh, river bottom and them areas, you know, uh, all the time. I've never actually fished Little Seneca, though, believe it or not. Really? You no, know, I've had jet boats. I've had three jet boats in my lifetime and tons of glass boats and aluminum boats. So uh, four locks, <clears throat> four locks uh, and big slack water is primarily where I fish in river bottom with the jet boat is where I fished locally in the Hagerstown area. Uh, and other than that, I just go to the, uh, either the upper Bay or mostly the tidal Potomac and then wherever the tournaments take me. Do you still have a jet boat or is it you just glass? No, I just have uh, I have a 2022 20, Skeeter FXR 21 with two. Nice. Top-hop. Yeah. That's nice. I just got rid of my range. I had a Ranger, uh, uh, 2017 had that for about four or five years and I got a good deal with a Skeeter. Not sponsored, but uh, you know, I'm not really concerned about sponsors at this point in my career. I just want to have fun and uh, win some tournaments. I'm probably going to do some more Toyota series. I thought about jumping in the opens, but that's just a huge commitment, you know. It's so much money. And I don't have any aspirations to fish in the elite. So uh, I think the Toyota series would be better. You got three tournaments, chance to win, get a uh, chance to make the top 25, and fish the. Uh, the championship for 200,000. So that's plus I, the payback is better. Correct. than the opens. Yeah, it is. And it's championship. There's no championship in the opens. Yeah. You know, so you do, I mean, the championship would be, if you win one, you go to the Bassmaster classic, which would be awesome. But, uh, I'll just stick with major league fish and they, they do a pretty good job. They both do really, but for, no, for me, they, right. They do. Don't get me wrong. Uh, Something heck crazy happens and I get the right opportunity. You know, I'm not saying I wouldn't do. I almost did pull the trigger last year when they first had the EQs, you know, these first announced it. I wanted to do it, but it just, you know, the time and uh, the, my boss would let me have the time off. I needed no problem, but uh, it's just the money. It'd be a good 35 grand invested. So, and that's the problem is it's like burning money. I mean, yeah. and then, on the flip side, like you said, like if you were trying to purely make money at this, the bass opens make no sense because they don't even pay back well. It's a hundred percent all about getting that Bassmaster Elite berth. Because it's not about 40 making plate, money. That's it. Yeah. Forty. Now we went to Gunnersville last year, the first tournament for the Toyota series, and some older guy sat on a point throwing a rattle trap, won eighty thousand dollars. They had three hundred and twenty eight boats. It was the busiest tournament I ever seen. And uh you know, he just sat there. He didn't have a Phoenix or he'd have wanted 115,000 because they paid 35 extra, you know. Wow. But he, uh, he still cashed 80,000 for 1700 entry fee, which is pretty cool. That's, that's stupid. <laughs> and, and then the other reason I didn't do the opens was because my buddies weren't going there. So I'd had to cover my hotel expenses, my room and board, you know, that would just make it that much more. So. Uh, traveling with my friends, uh, you know, like fishing the Shenandoah division, uh, Mark Tuck has a house right on the, uh, right by the Smith Mount Lake. We stay there. Uh, Steve Wiseman, who's an excellent fisherman. He, uh, has a house right on the Potomac river and we stay at his house for those two. So three of the five tournaments we have, you know, accommodations, which is pretty nice. Now, are you fishing just the Shenandoah? Or are you also fishing the Piedmont? <clears throat> I was going to do the Piedmont, but I decided just to do the Shenandoah because I want to win. I'm putting all my focus on these five tournaments. And uh, I might fish the uh, the, the, uh, Shen- the Potomac if it comes to the Toyota Series, if it comes to the Potomac, which it is. I made In September, I think. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm on the fish, I might fish that one. But other than that, I'm just going to try to concentrate and top five every one of these tournaments try to win one of them so it looks like you got clean sailing this because it's um and guys we're just gonna this will be uh, we'll be ending with this so you got kerr then you got smith this weekend then basically it's just tidal water the rest of the way potomac james potomac right so the way i look at it the kerr has been my nemesis and i finally got a top five I, yep uh my last tournament at, at smith mountain was a top three so i'm hoping i can you know do something similar and then Potomac, I know real well. I know all of them real well, but just I've never done well on Kerr for some reason. Now that I got that under my belt, I'm I'm sure I can catch some fish on Smith Mountain and then Potomac and James. So should be good. Well, 
Lee, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time tonight and good luck this weekend. And then uh, is there anybody you want to give a shout out to Any, anyone sponsors or <laughs> your work? No, I guess because no they are your sponsor. Just, you know, appreciate my, you know, the job I got that pays, you know, the right amount of money and still lets me have off all the time I want. And I always like to give a shout out to my buddy, Frank Ippoletti. He's mentored me for forever for like 35 years. We've been good friends. And Steve Wiseman and Mark Tuck, you know, for their friendship and fellowship and uh, being able to stay at their homes, you know, and help us, uh, you know, have a nice place to stay when we fish these tournaments. So, and I appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. It was nice meeting you. No, and sir, I appreciate you coming on and giving some time just to share your knowledge. Again, guys, like and subscribe to the channel. really helps us out with the algorithm. Please give him a follow on all of his social media. Everything we talked about will be linked in the episode description. We might be talking a little bit longer, but we're done here. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.